Have you ever wondered why some people seem to navigate life with ease while others struggle at every turn? It's about self-discipline and knowing what to let go of. And what if I told you that finding self-discipline lies in the ancient philosophy of Stoicism? Stoicism, a school of thought born around 300 BCE in the bustling markets of Athens, taught that happiness can be found in accepting the moment as it is, not allowing ourselves to be controlled by our desire for pleasure or fear of pain. As the great Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius said, our life is what our thoughts make it. Today we're going to explore how this timeless philosophy can help you declutter your life from things that drag you down and keep you from becoming the best version of yourself. We'll identify and discuss 11 habits and mindsets that, according to the Stoics, should be quickly eliminated from our lives. In the words of the founding father of Stoicism, Zeno of Sidium, well-being is attained by little and little, and nevertheless is no little thing itself. Remember, this is not just a passive viewing experience, it's an interactive experience, and we invite you to actively participate sharing your perspectives. Stay with us to the end, as this journey promises not just knowledge, but an opportunity for deep self-reflection and transformation. Let's begin. Habit number one unhealthy comparison with others. Firstly, let's tackle one of the most common pitfalls, the harmful act of comparing ourselves with others, particularly through the lens of social media, a habit we've all been guilty of, often without even realizing it, is something we must learn to overcome. We find ourselves aimlessly scrolling through our feeds at all hours of the day and night, allowing ourselves to be drawn into a virtual world where everyone else's life seems somehow brighter, more exciting, and richer than our own. This is a silent echo of what Stoic philosopher Seneca once said, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. Seneca was right. We scrutinize these carefully chosen highlights, these meticulously curated moments that are often far from the ordinary, everyday realities of life, suffering imaginary setbacks. We deceive ourselves with the illusion of perfection and begin to compare our realities with these idealized images of what life should be like. And in doing so, we set ourselves up for disappointment and dissatisfaction. Beware, this is a dangerously downward slope. It may start off as a harmless leisure activity, but when we begin to compare, we unknowingly embark on a journey that leads us away from self-contentment and towards self-devaluation. As Seneca stresses, a man is as miserable as he thinks he is. What you need to bear in mind, as Marcus Aurelius said, is that you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. So while you don't have power over what you see on social media, you have power over how much it affects you. Our self-esteem should never be determined by how we measure up to others, but rather by our innate strength, tenacity, and the compassion we radiate back to the world. Marcus Aurelius wisely said, The object in life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. We need to learn to appreciate our own worth, to recognize our own strengths and achievements, to celebrate our own victories no matter how small they may seem. Always keep in mind, as Marcus Aurelius reminds us, your worth does not revolve around what others think. Your worth is what you put into your worth. Your worth is the act of valuing yourself. Your worth should be measured by the kindness we show to others, by the comfort we offer to those in need, by the love we give to those around us. In doing so, we heed the wisdom of Seneca, who said, Life is like a play. It's not the length, but the excellence of the acting that matters. So let's refocus on our growth, rather than comparing ourselves to others. Habit number two negative self-talk. The next thing you need to eliminate from your life is negative self-talk. This is the hushed conversation you have with yourself, an intimate exchange that often happens in the quiet confines of your mind. It is an internal dialogue, a silent discourse, a ceaseless whisper that could either be a propelling force towards your aspirations or a constant hindrance in your path. The great Stoic philosopher, who was once a slave, said, it is not the things themselves that disturb people, 
but their judgments about those things. Indeed, self-talk is an invisible companion, always present, always influential. It can be both your staunchest ally, pushing you forward in your quest for achievement, or your most formidable foe, ruthlessly criticizing you at every turn, imposing doubt, and breeding insecurities. When your self-talk veers towards the negative, it begins to shape your reality, transforming into a self-fulfilling prophecy that can hinder personal growth and affect your mental health significantly. It's like a dark, self-created cloud that hangs over your thoughts, casting shadows of doubt and fear that can distort your perception of reality. This brings us to the teachings of Seneca. He once professed a nugget of wisdom that holds true to this day. A sword by itself does not slay. It is merely the weapon used by the slayer. This profound philosophy is not only applicable to our reaction to external circumstances, but also to our internal dialogue. The Stoics held a deep-seated belief that our true power resides not in controlling the events in our external world, which are often beyond our reach, but in mastering our internal world, our minds. As Zeno said, man conquers the world by conquering himself. Now we need to address the question, how do we shift from negative self-talk to positive self-talk? A journey that has immense potential to transform our lives, enrich our experiences, and foster a healthier, more compassionate relationship with ourselves. A suitable starting point would be to raise awareness. Initiate by being conscious of your thoughts. Pay close attention to your inner dialogue. Identify instances where you are unduly harsh on yourself. Seek out patterns in your self-talk that lead to negative emotions. It is important to challenge such thoughts. Resist the urge to accept this negativity as an absolute truth. Next, substitute these harmful thoughts with positive affirmations. Affirmations that uplift you, that convince you of your strengths, your potential, and your worth. Remember, the words you utter to yourself carry significant weight. As Marcus Aurelius said, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. This profound insight illuminates the importance of nurturing positive self-talk. The way we talk to ourselves shapes our perception and influences our actions. It's time to heed the Stoic wisdom. Communicate with yourself as you would with a cherished one. Habit number three, excessive screen time. Our next focal point is the excessive or futile use of screen time. As we navigate this technologically rich era, we find ourselves ensnared in a spider web of digital screens. These screens, in the form of mobile phones, laptops, televisions, and more, are like sirens, luring us into their captivating world of information and entertainment. Their presence is undeniably enticing, gripping us for endless hours. Of course, we must acknowledge that you might be watching one of these screens now. But our purpose is different. Why? Because this experience will enrich your existence beyond the realm of mindless social media. You see, our perspective is not to discount the benefits of technology, but to highlight the adverse consequences of its overuse. It's about realizing that there's a world beyond these screens, a world that merits our undivided attention and engagement, a world that offers experiences that are not just virtual but real. Another insightful quote by Seneca states, It's not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste much of it. This statement anchors a vital truth, particularly in the context of our discussion. It resonates as a reminder that our time on Earth is finite, and that each second is priceless. We, as the privileged species, must scrutinize how we spend our time. The relentless scrolling and endless hours devoted to screens are, unfortunately, manifestations of squandered time that could be redirected towards more enriching activities. Digital detox, a term coined to describe the conscious avoidance of electronic devices, can be a practical solution. Brief periods of disconnecting from our screens can serve as a rejuvenating pause for both our minds and eyes. This pause can recharge our mental health, diminish stress, amplify concentration, and uplift our overall productivity. It's not about wholly discarding technology, but about forging a balanced relationship with it. Marcus Aurelius wisely stated, 
Very little is needed for everything to be upset and ruined, only a slight lapse in reason. Hence the key lies in making discerning choices, preferring face-to-face -face interactions over digital ones, embracing wisdom over mere facts, and appreciating authenticity over the virtual world. These choices can foster a connection with our surroundings, allowing us to engage more meaningfully with the people around us and experience life firsthand, not merely as passive observers on a screen. To encapsulate, it ultimately pertains to the concept of time. Time, the irrevocable asset that we cannot retrieve once it slips through our fingers. It is a valuable treasure that we should guard and invest judiciously. As Epictetus put it, never he is free who is not master of himself. So, let us not be slaves to our screens, but channel our time towards pursuits that enrich us in our lives. Habit number four, procrastination. Next on our list is the ever-present specter of procrastination. A ubiquitous presence in our daily lives, it eerily hovers around the periphery of our consciousness, a persistent shadow that never fails to cast a dark veil over our best laid plans. This phantom beguiles us with the alluring mirage of later, whispering sweet nothings about tomorrow, the day after, the forthcoming week, the impending month, or the close at hand year. Procrastination thrives on our inaction, feeding on our hesitations growing stronger with each passing moment of indecision. In the face of procrastination, Epictetus teaches us one thing. Happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within our control, and some things are not. And you are in control of your actions, how you spend your time, and what you will prioritize or not. You see, Stoics put a great emphasis on righteousness and self-discipline. Epictetus again had some wise words. First say to yourself what you would be, and then do what you have to do. Procrastination is, after all, a silent thief, a robber of life's most valuable, most precious, and most fleeting resource, time. It's an unseen bandit, stealthily pilfering our golden opportunities for personal growth, self-improvement, professional development, and vital learning experiences. Its impacts are far-reaching and its consequences often irreversible. As Seneca wisely warned us, it is not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a great deal of it. The gravity of his warning resonates when we find ourselves, our schedules and ambitions entrapped in procrastination. But amidst all this, let's not forget, as Marcus Aurelius sagely noted, you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. His words serve as a stark reminder that the present moment is the only absolute we truly possess. The past is a memory, the future, but a promise. The present is all we have, all we can control, all we can truly in. So, in the spirit of seizing the day, pledge to take a stand against procrastination. As Zeno of Sidium said, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So let's promise ourselves to not put things off, to not delay or dawdle, to not hesitate, to not look back. It's never too late to take the initiative to step forward, to make a move. Habit number five, mindless multitasking. Next in line, we confront the mirage of productivity, mindless multitasking. As we often exalt in our ability to juggle multiple tasks at once, viewing it as a testament to our efficiency and proficiency, we are actually falling into the trap of a common illusion. In the words of Marcus Aurelius, concentrate every minute on doing what's in front of you with precise and genuine seriousness. This means concentrating on one task instead of juggling multiple ones. So ingrained is this predilection for juggling multiple tasks in our culture that we frequently find ourselves lost in a never-ending quest for productivity. The bitter truth is that what we consider a symbol of efficiency is far from it. Epictetus held a similar view, stating, If you wish to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. In other words, it is better to focus on one task and do it well, rather than attempting to handle many poorly. 
Multitasking, especially mindless multitasking, is a deceptive illusion. Our perception of efficiency, of being able to handle numerous tasks simultaneously, is fundamentally flawed. The harsh reality is, multitasking more often than not leads to a decline in productivity and an escalation in stress. With each task you pile upon your already overloaded platter, divides your attention. The immense pressure to complete multiple tasks simultaneously leads to overwhelming stress and increased chances of errors. Marcus Aurelius once advised, do every act of your life as though it were your last. This suggests that we should focus on each task individually, giving it our full attention rather than rushing through several tasks at once. Reflecting upon the teachings of Seneca provides further insight into the pitfalls of multitasking. Seneca once remarked, to be everywhere is to be nowhere. His words serve as a stark reminder of the importance of concentrated mindful activity. They emphasize the idea that when we spread our attention too thinly across a multitude of tasks, we achieve less than what we set out to do. Rather than stretching ourselves too thin, we should focus on devoting our entire attention to a single task at a time. This single tasking fosters mindfulness, brings clarity of thought, and reduces the risk of errors. As Epictetus stated, no great thing is created suddenly. By allocating our complete attention and effort to one task, we are more likely to produce high-quality results and improve our overall well-being. This isn't to say that we should always stick to single-tasking. There's a time and place for multitasking. However, it should be carried out mindfully and strategically, not mindlessly. It's essential to understand the difference between productive multitasking and disruptive multitasking. By implementing the practice of mindful single-tasking, we ensure that we're giving our best effort to each task. This approach is more likely to yield whether it's in the context of our personal lives or professional endeavors. A shift from multitasking to mindful single-tasking can make a significant difference in our energy levels as well as our mental health. As Seneca advised, it is quality rather than quantity that matters. So bear in mind, in the combat against mindless multitasking, the victorious tactic is to do less, but do it exceptionally well. Don't fall into the trap of mindless multitasking. Instead, focus on mindful single-tasking. Habit number six, excessive worrying. The tyranny of excessive worrying is our next topic. This is a heavy chain we often elect to wear, but for what purpose? Is it an intrinsic part of our human nature to worry excessively, or is it a learned behavior, an offshoot of our environment? Worrying, particularly when it becomes chronic, has a way of binding us, restricting our potentiality and freedom. Its oppressive weight can lead to a myriad of health challenges, both physically and mentally, inducing anxiety, depression, and stress-related illnesses. Remember the wise words of Epictetus, people are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. Ponder over it. Overworrying plunders our tranquility, our peace. It depletes our vitality and excitement, replacing it with doubt and uncertainty. This can quickly turn into chronic stress, if not addressed. Marcus Aurelius reflected on fear in perspective to death. He said, it is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. So, how can we tackle this issue? The Stoic philosophers provided a profound insight into this matter. They postulated that the majority of our worries are rooted in the future, a sphere that is unpredictable and beyond our control. To echo Seneca's thoughtful note, the greatest obstacle to living is expectancy, which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today. This observation is profound and holds a great deal of truth. Often our worries are not reflections of reality, they're cogs of our imagination. Our mind concocts scenarios and possibilities, amplifying our fears and anxieties, causing us unnecessary pain. However, this doesn't mean we should dismiss our worries. Rather, as Epictetus suggested, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. We should identify them, acknowledge their existence, and allow them to dissipate. This is liberation from the shackles of worry. This is the essence of Stoicism, living in the present, 
accepting what we cannot alter, and making amendments where we can. As Marcus Aurelius emphasized, very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. By focusing on the present, we can channel our energy towards initiatives that make a positive impact on our lives and society. In the grand scheme of things, worrying does not eradicate the problems of tomorrow. Rather, it drains the peace and serenity of today. Zeno of Sidium wisely said, What need is there to weep over parts of life? The whole of it calls for tears. As you journey through life, remember this. Worrying does not eliminate tomorrow's problems. It merely depletes today's peace. This is a potent reminder of the futility of worry and the importance of living in the present. Habit number seven, overcommitting. Overcommitting ranks next on our compilation of common pitfalls, a snare many of us unknowingly walk into time and again. It's a situation in which we often find ourselves, sometimes oblivious of the path we've chosen, other times disregarding the warning signs because we're too ensnared in this ceaseless loop of commitments. This dire mistake finds its root in unrealistic expectations and improper time management. It creates a volatile path to a myriad of harmful effects, including stress, fatigue, and in extreme cases, it may even culminate in burnout. We inhabit an era where productivity is exalted and busyness is perceived as a mark of distinction. But it's worth pondering. At what sacrifice? Are we forfeiting our tranquility, wellness, and personal contentment on the anvil of overcommitment? Epictetus noted, Do not seek to bring things to pass in accordance with your wishes, but wish for them as they are, and you will find them. As we delve into the essence of Stoic philosophy, it advocates balance and moderation in all aspects of life, urging us to nurture a healthy equilibrium. Observing our frantic lives through this prism, we realize we are not exhausting time. Rather, we're simply failing to utilize it judiciously. So, the question manifests, how do we liberate ourselves from this intricate web we've woven? The solution is straightforward, yet implementation may be arduous. We need to commence by establishing achievable expectations. Quality trumps quantity, and it's how proficiently we can accomplish a task, rather than the number of tasks we can juggle. Along with setting expectations, mastering the art of declining is critical. Moreover, prioritization of commitments is essential. Not all tasks bear the same significance. Distinguishing between the urgent and the important, the critical but not urgent tasks and the non-critical tasks can significantly enhance our time management. Effective time management, frequently underrated, is the cornerstone to preventing overcommitment. We must recognize our limits and strive not to exceed them. Seneca's wise words resonate here. True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. There are only 24 hours in a day, and we need to make peace with this reality. It's preferable to do less and do it well, than to do more and do it inadequately. The key lies in remembering that it's not about grappling with countless tasks, but about how effectively we carry them out. Seneca once said, life is long if you know how to use it. So, let's cease over committing and begin crafting our balance in life. Habit number eight, perfectionism. Our next point is the self-imposed prison of perfectionism. This concept, deeply embedded in our psyche, is more than just a simple desire to excel. It's an all-encompassing, relentless pursuit for flawlessness that, if left unchecked, can morph into a self-destructive cycle. This obsession with achieving perfection can have adverse effects on our mental health, leading us to constantly second-guess ourselves and doubt our capabilities. Epictetus dissected perfectionism in his teachings. He said, Progress is not attained by luck or accident, but by working on oneself daily. Additionally, he stated that, No great thing is created suddenly. This implies that perfection, if it were achievable, is a process and not an immediate outcome. Unfortunately, the relentless pursuit of perfection often blinds us to our daily incremental improvements. Seneca stated, It is progress that you should desire, not perfection. 
This sparks a sense of dissatisfaction within us, causing us to overlook our small victories and hence stalling our overall progress. Marcus Aurelius, also wisely counseled, welcome whatever comes to you woven into the fabric of your destiny for what could more aptly fulfill your needs. Moreover, he said, never esteem anything as an advantage to you that will make you break your word or lose your self-respect. In our quest for perfection, we often forget that as Epictetus taught, difficulties are things that show a person what they are. We ignore the fact that these missteps offer valuable lessons that give us the opportunity to improve. Many of us are held captive by the idea of perfection, but it's important to remember that it is an unattainable goal. A more constructive approach, therefore, might be to strive for progress instead of perfection. As the Stoics believed, the key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best. Seeking excellence, acknowledging our imperfections, and learning from our mistakes can lead to a healthier mindset and overall personal development. As the saying goes, strive not to be a success but rather to be of value. Our focus should be on continuous growth, embracing our unique characteristics, acknowledging our shortcomings, and striving for excellence. Remember the words of Seneca, a gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. Habit number nine, avoiding feedback. Coming next in our exploration is the fear of feedback. Marcus Aurelius once said, the object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. Isn't that what we're doing when we dodge criticism? This instinctive behavior of eluding feedback, a trait that many of us harbor more often than we'd like to admit, can ironically end up being a formidable barrier to both our personal and professional advancement. According to the wisdom of Stoic philosophy, this tendency is more damaging than we realize. The Stoics, in their deep understanding of human nature, fostered a more receptive approach towards criticism. Now, let's reflect on this. Seneca posited, Difficulties strengthen the mind, as labor does the body. How then can we enhance our talents, or abilities, if we're in the dark about our missteps? How can we aspire to improve ourselves if we're not willing to acknowledge our flaws and strive to rectify them? It's an uncomfortable truth to face, but it is essential that we begin recognizing constructive criticism as a tool for growth and improvement, not a personal attack or an assault on our identity. Let's strive to avoid this unproductive pitfall and instead make a conscious, deliberate effort to not only accept, but actively seek out feedback. Epictetus wisely stated, The key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best. So, let's shift our mindset and start viewing criticism in a positive light, an opportunity to learn, to grow, to evolve. When we embrace this change in perspective, we can truly start to flourish. We can identify our weaknesses, comprehend our errors, making the necessary changes to improve. This is the path to becoming the best versions of ourselves. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. This is a powerful statement that perfectly encapsulates the essence of constructive criticism. Feedback is the fuel that drives champions. It's high time we all start indulging in this feast and truly start to harness the power of feedback. After all, if we aspire to become champions, we need to start acting like champions, and that starts with embracing feedback. In the words of Seneca, it is a rough road that leads to the heights of greatness. Habit number 10, Toxic Relationships Next, we enter the difficult realm of toxic relationships. A concept that has been a subject of study since antiquity, Toxic relationships present a stark contrast to the principles of Stoic philosophy. As Seneca once said, associate with people who are likely to improve you. This is a clear indictment of toxic relationships and a call to foster healthy connections. The ancient Stoic philosophers viewed us as highly social creatures, destined to thrive in harmony with our counterparts. They believed that our purpose and happiness are intrinsically linked with how we interact and coexist with others. However, when this harmonious balance is disrupted and relationships turn toxic, they act as a venom slowly permeating into our core, eroding our mental equilibrium and hindering our personal evolution. 
Toxic relationships are like quicksand. The more you struggle, the deeper you sink. Seneca once said, we should not, like sheep, follow the herd of creatures in front of us, making our way where others go, not where we ought to go. Now this principle does not advocate for exploiting individuals for personal advantage, rather. It encourages aligning yourself with those who invigorate, inspire, and challenge you. Those who contribute to your growth and transform you into a better version of yourself. As Seneca said, we should always be asking ourselves, is this something that is, or is not, in my control. A valuable lesson for us to apply in managing relationships. Toxic relationships often lack respect, empathy, and shared growth. It's a space where manipulation, deceit, and control take precedence over love, understanding, and mutual respect. Here, one person's needs are prioritized over the others, making the relationship one-sided and unhealthy. Seneca wisely said, Life is like a play. It's not the length, but the excellence of the acting that matters. This serves as a reminder to stay true to yourself and to not tolerate toxic relationships. Breaking free from these shackles requires courage and self-love. Always bear in mind that you deserve respect and affection. You are not obligated to set yourself on fire to keep others warm. A crucial element of self-care involves being discerning about who you permit into your life. It's about choosing relationships that foster growth, nurture positivity, and encourage mutual respect and understanding. Habit number 11, ignoring your mental health. Last, but certainly not least, is the neglect of mental health, which often includes ignoring it entirely. This is a topic of profound importance, deserving of our utmost attention and concern. In the whirlwind of our busy lives with the constant pressures and demands of work, family, and society, we often neglect the very thing that holds us together, our mind. This neglect is not just a simple oversight, it can be egregious and detrimental, stemming from a lack of understanding, stigma, or sheer indifference. Drawing from the wisdom of ancient philosophers and modern science, it's vital to recognize that the mind and the body are intrinsically connected forming the two halves of our holistic existence. The body is the vessel that carries us through life, and the mind is the compass that guides us. Just as we feed and nourish our bodies, our minds too require sustenance, care, and nurturing. By neglecting our mental health, we inadvertently allow ourselves to be swayed by external events. Seneca urged individuals to look after their mental health. In his words, as long as you live, keep learning how to live. This charge challenges us to continually prioritize and nourish our mental well-being as a way of life. The culture of silence surrounding mental health only amplifies the potential harm caused by neglect. When we push aside our mental health, we are essentially dismissing a key facet of ourselves. This can trigger a cascade of issues, including anxiety, depression, stress, and burnout all which can cause significant distress and impair our functionality. It's a common misconception that acknowledging mental health struggles is a sign of weakness. This couldn't be further from the truth. It takes strength and self-awareness to recognize when we are struggling, to admit that we may have been ignoring our mental health and to seek help when needed. Checking in with ourselves, engaging in self-care, seeking professional help, and extending compassion towards ourselves are all part of mental health hygiene. It's about making mental health a priority, recognizing our feelings, understanding our needs, and taking the necessary steps to ensure our mental well-being. Epictetus once said, we cannot be attached to things or people, for if we are, then we are bound to be upset when we lose them. It's okay to prioritize your mental health, to put yourself first, to take a step back and focus on healing. The dialogue around mental health needs to shift from one of neglect and dismissal to one of understanding, acceptance, and prioritization. This requires a collective effort. It starts with acknowledging our own mental health, with understanding its importance, and with not shying away from seeking help when needed. So don't just ignore your mental health, acknowledge it. Take the time to check in with yourself. Seek help when you need it. Remember, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to prioritize and not ignore your mental health. 
Conclusion We've covered a lot of ground today, haven't we? From the pitfalls of unhealthy comparisons and negative self-talk, to the perils of procrastination and mindless multitasking. We've shined a light on excessive worrying, overcommitting, and the trap of perfectionism. We've underscored the importance of embracing feedback, severing toxic relationships, and, crucially, not ignoring your mental health. Each of these 11 points, drawn from the wellspring of Stoic wisdom, is a signpost on the path to a better you. A reminder to not merely exist, but to live and live well. They beckon us to quit the habits and mindsets that hold us back, to make space for growth, resilience, and serenity. And so, as we draw this journey to a close, remember, self-improvement isn't a sprint, but a marathon. It's a process, a journey. It's about progress, not perfection. Remember, the journey to self-improvement is a marathon, not a sprint. Go forth and conquer your life one step at a time.